Welcome to the Gooder Podcast, where we talk with powerhouse women in CPG about their journeys to success. This episode is sponsored by Retail Voodoo, a brand development firm guiding mission-driven consumer brands to attract new and passionate consumer base, crush their categories through growth and innovation, and magnify their social and environmental impact. If your brand is in need of brand positioning, package design, or marketing activation, we are here to help. You can find more information at www.retail-voodoo.com. Well, hello, Diana Frake here. I am the host of the Gooder Podcast, where I get to talk with the powerhouse women in the food, beverage, and wellness categories about their journeys to success and their insights on the industry. This episode is brought to you by Retail Voodoo. Retail Voodoo is a brand development firm, and our clients include Starbucks, Kind, REI, PepsiCo, Heike, and many other market leaders. We provide strategic brand and design services for leading brands in food, wellness, beverage, and fitness. If your goal is to increase market share, drive growth, or disrupt the marketplace with new and innovative ideas, give us a call and let's talk. You can find out more at retail-voodoo.com. Wow. Today we get to meet, well, miss, not miss, we get to meet Erica Cottrell, Vice President of Marketing with Harbor Wholesale. Erica is a proven leader building beloved brands with inspired marketing and innovation that consumers, customers, and employees love. Consumer-centered leader leveraging entrepreneurial, mid-size, and Fortune 500 experience to lead the strategic planning, development, and execution of a company's business objectives. She has driven significant growth and strength in leading teams through growth and challenge and change while inspiring them to work with passion and confidence. Well, hello, Erica. How are you today? Good. Hi, Diana. Nice to see you here. Yes. Where are you located? Uh, I am home today, um, which many of us can understand. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. And you are in Washington State, yes? Correct. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Love the local. Oh, yes, definitely. I know. Hi, really quick, I want to congratulate your team again on the Skippers oh, brand acquisition. Mm-hmm. For those of you outside of the Northwest market, uh, Harbor Wholesale acquired a brand that is sort of a Northwestish family brand yeah, yeah. long term. Yeah. A lot was, of nostalgia attached yes. to that brand. Yes. Yes. And so really excited to see and curious to see what ends up becoming of that brand that is now moved into CPG. And um, who knows what? Maybe there'll be a theme park soon. I don't know. <laughs> We have all sorts of fun thoughts. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, sorry for that tangent. That's okay. Well, I like to talk about your story, but first off, I always love it when brand owners and leaders get to tell us about the company or the brand that they're working with. Since you guys are a little bit different than what, uh, you know, Harbor Wholesale is a little bit different than the types of clients I have on the show, but the same. Um, I wonder, tell us a little bit about Let's get to your story. First of all, or first off, I always like it when brand owners and business leaders get to tell us about their brand and their business. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Harbor Wholesale and why it exists? Yeah, it's a unique company. Um, Most people would probably wonder why I'm on this podcast when you hear Harbor Wholesale. So it's almost a hundred year old company that uh, started back in 1923 by the Erickson family. Mm. And it is now fourth generation run uh, Northwest distributor. It's the largest independently run distributor in the Northwest. Uh, We service 4,500 convenience stores and independent stores uh, with all sorts of wonderful items. But the thing that really drew me in was the fact they also have created seven different brands Mm. that they own um, and they are exclusive to Harbor. Okay. And so Skippers was our most recent acquisition, but the other brands are all homegrown. So it's really interesting to get to be part of the distribution as well as the creative side of creating new brands. Yeah. So uh, right now, uh, maybe at a really high level, 
Can you tell us what those brands are and kind of what the categories are and what it is that you are wanting to service your clients with by having those brands? Sure. A lot, but yeah. So um, we have brands like Skippers, which Mm -hmm. seafood, um, but then we also have brands that we've created like Via Vita Pizza, Mm. and we have two different coffee companies, Split Shift Coffee and Watertown. Um, We also have created something called Mountain Fresh, which is all things that are for on the go people uh, who love to be in the outdoors, who love to explore life. And all of those items we sell within the convenience and independent grocery Uh stores that we go to. And not only do we sell them retail, but we've also created our own QSR locations. So if you think about, sometimes you'll go into a large convenience store and you'll see they have a McDonald's or a taco time or something like that. Well, we've created our own QSR brands with Via Vita and somebody can go in and order a pizza or, or take a take and bake pizza Mm -hmm. to go. Um, And so we've created brands that we know consumers are going to love. Mm -hmm. Um, and that those convenience stores then can also act like some of the big boys out there without Mm -hmm. being part of a hundred unit chain, Mm -hmm. they can do it independently. Mm -hmm. Mm. Very interesting. I see kind of, um, I I like the approach to kind of supporting those small and maybe Mm -hmm. independent mid-size type of grocers out there that sometimes have a hard time uh, with the distribution and kind of finding something that is uniquely their own. Right. And some of these independent stores are creating, they have their own communities. And Mm -hmm. so those communities come in and yes, they love to get all of their quick snacks and things on the go or pick up milk on the way home, but then they can also pick up a meal. Um, and so that becomes just another great tool in their their toolbox. And, and like you said, they are independents and they are entrepreneurs. And, Mm -hmm. and so we'd love to support them and help them grow, um, which is something very unique at Harbor. Yeah. Nice. So you joined the team about, uh, I'm just going to call it six months ago, roughly. Um, and you've been at places like Sahale and, uh, was it Dryers, briars. Well, that was a while ago. A yes, few other Muckers and, yes. and some really big brands. Yeah. What drew you to this opportunity? It, it's a really interesting combination of a lot of jobs I've had over my career. It has distribution, which I did early on. Um, but then it has that small time feel mm. um, within this really large organization that has the resources it needs to get things done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, large company, but a big, big heart. And um, that always draws me in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love it. Now you've held roles in finance operations and marketing. So um, you've seen businesses at all sorts of, from different angles can you, this is going to be a big question, but this is kind of like, <laughs> how, how did you get to Harbor Wholesale? Like, can you sort of see the path here, some decisions or, uh, well, I'll let you tell that story. Yeah. So I had an amazing mentor early on in my career who was great at taking time and saying, what do you want to be when you grow up, Erica? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? I was a marketing, had a marketing Mm -hmm. degree, but I was in sales at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And I said, I want to run my own company someday. And he said, well, then you need to learn all parts of a company. Even if marketing is, you know, what your major passion is, you need to understand the P&L. You need to understand what it takes to run a truck um, stock yes. a shelf, all of those things. So that as you are leading your team, you understand all the components that go into that and you make good business decisions overall, mm-hmm. that you're not making it in a silo, um, or just for the better betterment of whatever department you're in. And right. so I really took that to heart and anytime an opportunity came up, I said, yes. 
<laughs> even when I didn't know how I was going to do it, or if, if they really had picked the right person for the job, mm -hmm. I said yes. And I found those around me who supported me and helped me out. Mm -hmm. The, uh, that's so interesting. I'm going to just say this. There's another company that you worked for that I actually have a soft spot for mm -hmm. um, Front Porch Classics, but I knew them. I, I had worked with them prior to you joining the organization. And it was so interesting for me to see that uh, with them, you were more on the finance side. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that approach from your mentor that says seeing the business from not just academically the different views but like literally sitting in the seat and saying okay this is this is what reality looks like for somebody in finance versus yeah. r&d versus uh marketing etc so uh it seems like you're bringing all of those elements to you right in this moment well, I really feel like a marketer has to be a general manager as well. Mm -hmm. They need to understand all those different pieces so that they don't create a product that maybe your consumers love, but doesn't make any sense for the business that mm -hmm. it lives in or doesn't yes. make sense to deliver or ship. Or There's so many components that go right. into creating a product and exactly. doing a business plan. All of those pieces are integral and mm -hmm. in a marketer creating new products and taking it out into the, into the marketplace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Janet Lee and I talked about that as well. It's so interesting. You guys have the same philosophy. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about Sahali because uh, when you and I originally met, uh, our retail voodoo team was working with your team mm -hmm. on the rebrand that eventually led to the Smuckers acquisition. And you had a major role in not just the the brand work, you know, working with Edmund and the rest of the team to kind of build Sahali up to that point. But then you were very much involved with transitioning this amazing Northwest brand to a big CPG. But we had the dynamics of this Sahali leadership, which permeates culturally through the organization. Right. I maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you can remember being kind of the bigger challenges of the transition. Uh, yeah, we'll just start with that. Oh, goodness. Well, you can imagine when a very large publicly held company buys a very, you know, a much smaller mm -hmm. entrepreneurial company, there's a lot that goes into that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, being part of that Whole management team that looked at all the different companies coming through. Mm -hmm. I had the unique viewpoint to see that there was something special with Smuckers. Um, they weren't purchasing us to just fold us in and make us go away. We knew that they valued what we had, who yes. we were, and that meant a lot to them. Um, I was lucky enough to be appointed general manager to after that acquisition and so started forming friendships with people over there. Um, culture, as you can imagine, is one of the culture and change. Those two big C's yeah. were big things to overcome. And, you know, at first, some of the, the Sahali people were like, oh, Erica, you're drinking the Kool-Aid. You talk about Smuckers. They're so great. And I'm like, no, guys, really, like you, you need to get to know them. And, and on the other side, I could see all my trips to Smuckers, mm -hmm. how much they valued what they had purchased. And they did not want to do anything to disrupt that. They had seen it happen in the market mm -hmm. over and over again, especially mm -hmm. during that time. It was happening a lot of a lot more going mm -hmm. on. Um, and so they, that's why they appointed me general manager. Typically they would have folded it into their business. So there, I did a lot of work with the team on how do we hold what is special about Sahali special mm -hmm. and what things about Smuckers can we embrace that are very similar yes. to the values that we had so that we weren't talking differences. We could talk similarities. Yes. And that started to break things down. And I, I created sort of a mentorship programs, partnering mm. people up with mm -hmm. smuckers 
people. So they had somebody that they could internally reach out to and say, Hey, I'm having hitting this roadblock. Yeah. Can you help me? Yeah. And that, that really started to help to where they had their own friendships. They weren't relying on mine yeah. um, to make that bridge happen. And, and those walls started to come down and we started to celebrate the, the coming together versus yeah. the differences. Yeah. I would say that, first of all, that the te- there's a there's some validity and credibility to what you're saying here, because if Smuckers was interested in cost engineering or just the ingredient profiles or your supply chain or your mm-hmm. channels or whatever, Sahali would not still be the Sahali that it is today. So there's a lot of there's a lot of honor there. But I think that that speaks to you as a leader, being able to bridge that gap and maybe not coming in um, defensive or adversarially, you know, and I don't know what was going on behind the scenes during the conversations is probably pretty friendly to begin with. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think for those multinationals or brands like Sahali that are wanting to look at sort of a textbook, how do you, how do you keep a brand that has credibility and legs whole during the transition and keep culture, you know, chain, bring the cultures together in a, in a fusion rather than adopt one way or the other. I think the way you managed it and the way your team managed it is really textbook and should be an example for a lot of other leaders that are wanting to do similar type of activities. Well, the other piece that I feel like was really pivotal for us was we created a what we called a venture team. Hmm. And we started realizing there were people not just in Seattle that were passionate about Sahali, but there were people in Smuckers who were so excited that we were on board and you know, they wanted Smuckers to stretch themselves and right. get into some of these new categories and things that they saw as the future. Um, of food. And so those people were evangelists for us out Mm -hmm. there in the world and ambassadors. And so this venture team, I looked for those people that were always there helping us with a positive attitude and, and went out and picked people across the organization. Sometimes they didn't even work or help us with Mm -hmm. Sahali. Mm -hmm. They were just so passionate about Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, would you be part of this venture team? And I brought them all out to Seattle and said, this is what you say you love so much. Let's talk about it. How do we make it survive within this large company? And then they went back out and they started educating too. So it wasn't just the Seattle folks. It was now this broader group that was really helping us from the inside out, um, to be successful. Yes. Well, exactly. Right. And I think a lot of times even still, or maybe more so in this exact moment, because there's so much VC coming in uh, or especially related to food technology and some of this new innovation, many people think it's financial acumen or sales bravado alone that defines a leader's ability to grow and develop a brand. But as you're saying here and and our experience as well is the leadership and culture building is almost paramount to that because without all of that work being done and people coming together, you end up working in silos and almost in fiefdoms for that matter. And And you talk about this, um, did you call it a venture? It's a venture group. Yeah. A venture yeah. team. Yeah. Right. Your venture team. You know, my question is, I'm curious to your approach to building and bolstering teams, especially when you're the new guy. Mm-hmm. Um, is this a, a, a tool that you use when you come into large organizations generally, or um, maybe you talk about that for just a moment. Yeah, I it definitely is something that has evolved. I'd say early in my career, mm-hmm. my MO would have been to be the one one that worked the hardest, the longest, you know, <laughs> try to beat everybody out, prove yeah. it to them. 
Um, and what I've learned over time is what gets to people even more so is just authenticity. Mm-hmm. So I try to just share with them from day one, my goofy self. I love, <laughs> I love my little Grogu, <laughs> you know, Yoda guy. And, yeah. uh, you know, I tell goofy jokes and I love to hike. And so I just share all of that about me mm-hmm. and in sharing about myself and that in sharing my personal at work, people start realizing that's okay. Mm -hmm. And they start realizing they can trust me. Mm -hmm. And once you start building that trust, you've got that foundation that then you can start to really make the change that you might need to make. But without that, you can't ask people to leap off a building or do something new that they've never done before if they don't trust you. So you've you have to start there. Yeah. Breaking down that professional barrier, so to speak, mm-hmm. is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, definitely. De- definitely. Yes. Right. I, I think that um, even still with the new generation, the younger generation Z, um, millennials, I see kind of as a mixed group by and large, but uh, we still bring these kind of old school, you know, suit and tie um, behaviors, even though we're not wearing them, we still kind of keep those behaviors with us. And I think they're starting to shed a little bit because, well, first of all, the speed at which we need to work together, we need to break down those barriers a little bit more quickly. And I think it's so much easier to just be who you are than it is to carry a facade, right? It is. It's a lot less tiring. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 Pardon me. I, um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about, because I know that you've been working with this uh, through the last several roles that you've been in, but probably more so now, and even in a different way, when it comes to kind of environmental impact and our industry, and by our industry, I really mean CPG and all the components that come along with it. I'm wondering how your team is addressing things like packaging, um, managing and managing some of those, I'm going to call them environmental costs, not necessarily financial costs. Is there anything that you guys have as an initiative right now, as you're kind of moving forward? Because we are talking about independent brands. And so that likely means we don't have centralized depots and we've got a lot of independent things going on. Anything you can share along that line? This is a crazy time right now. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we look at supply chain and we just hope that we get our orders on any given day. (laughs) And, you know, do you have enough employees to take the orders out? Um, It's, I've never seen anything quite like this. It's really crazy, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're constantly having those conversations about what we can do. It, Mm -hmm. It is interesting though, as we reach back out to suppliers they don't have the bandwidth right now to often help us with those things. They're really? Like, We're just trying to make a box. Right. Don't, don't ask us to go find a box that's compostable. Don't, yeah. don't ask us to, to do some of those other things. So mm-hmm. what it's, I guess, allowing us to do is we can still have all the conversations that mm-hmm. we need to have about where we want to go and the goals we want to set for each of these brands. Mm-hmm. Um, and outline all of those pieces, do the research and be ready for when those things open up again, hopefully by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. But it's a really interesting time right now. Yeah. And even more volatility, so to speak with, I mean, we never really have control over any, everything anyway. Mm -hmm. However, this time seems to be just every time something happens, we're like, okay, this is the worst it's going to get. Nope. Nope. There's, there's (laughs) more, there's more, there's more. (laughs) Oh my goodness. So when you are looking back on your, uh, when you're looking back on your um, path here, I wonder what, where do you find yourself having some of the most pride, you know, were there, is it the work that you did? Is it the relationships that you had? Can you speak to any of those things? 
Yes, it's definitely the people. It, that's what it always comes back to for me. It, mm-hmm. I think back on individuals, just like my first mentor that helped me um, mm-hmm. and has been there with me for over 25 years. And we still talk. It, it's just that kind of impact is really precious. And so I have people at every single job I've been at that I still talk to that they still call me up to say, Hey, Erica, can I have your ear for a few minutes? Right. And, um, I just, I get so proud of some of the things that those people have accomplished or, um, things that they remember. It's not necessarily the things that we did, but it's those moments mm-hmm. of growth. It's those moments that we spent together, mem- those memories, um, that just, I'll always have it's a it's that patchwork quilt that's out there of people and connections that is so important to me. Mm -hmm. Well, can you tell us maybe what's next for you? Probably, probably maybe what's next for Harbor Wholesale. Can you give us a peek into what might be happening in the next six to 12 months? Well, a lot of brand work. (laughs) So a lot of these brands that we have were developed, but we have not um, really filled them all in Mm -hmm. like they need to be filled in. So Mm -hmm. we've been going through and um, determining what's next for the innovation pipeline. Yeah. You know, do we take them outside of our current distribution network? Right. Do we go mm. further? What does e-commerce look like for us? So, oh my goodness, yep. Yes. So a lot of those things that um, maybe other brands would have already gotten done, we're, we're still, it's still early. We're still the incubator kind of mm-hmm. phase on some of these things. And that's really fun to have all of these brands to play with and Mm -hmm. and the teams to build. And sure. um, So a a lot of groundwork is being laid and a lot of details filled out, Mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's fun to be in this early Mm -hmm. um, and be able to, to build each of these brands out from, from the Mm get-go. I love those portfolio rationalization exercises too, because that's when you start to go, Hey, look, there's some daylight here. There's some there's some opportunity here to put in a new brand or extend one of these other lines to fill in an opportunity. Uh, uh, love working on those sorts of things. And I, I suspect you do too. Yes, definitely. And it, you know, it's interesting to be part of a bigger company where we don't have to have 20 million in sales year one. Right. You know, again, we can act like an entrepreneurial startup where mm-hmm. it can be slow. It can mm-hmm we have a solid base in the rest yeah. of our business. Yeah. We have distribution out there. Um, yeah. We've got a sales force that's excited for whatever we'll bring them. They mm-hmm. have so many ideas for us of other brands. I'm develop. sure. I am sure. Future. And so it's kind of hold them back while we get these really solid. Mm-hmm. But um, I think you'll see more brands coming down the pike from Harbor mm-hmm. Wholesale. Mm-hmm. Something, uh, do you see stretching your territory a little bit more are you nationwide no you're regional we're regional we're in yeah. the in the north and okay. anything's possible okay <laughs> all right everybody they, keep your eyes peeled right right yes okay. they have been growing leaps and bounds um these past few years so who knows where we'll go next mm, erica how fun i'm excited for you i'm excited for this kind of growth and i And uh, especially because because of where, like it's coming from an unconventional part of the Mm -hmm. industry. Does that make sense? So I love that. Mm -hmm. Exciting as Mm -hmm. well for me, just to, I never would have thought I'd end up at a distributor. Uh, When they first called me, I was like, what? No, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) And then I got into it and I was like, wow, there's a lot of opportunity Mm -hmm. here. And the people are amazing. The family feel is just so wonderful. So it's a great place. Love it. I'm really enjoying our conversation and we're starting to wrap up here. So I I do have some last few questions that I like to ask everybody if that's okay. Um, So maybe um, I always have, it's called this a happy hour fact or happy hour factoid. (laughs) 
something about either your industry or your business that people will be like, oh my goodness, I would have never guessed. Do you have something like that to share with us? Uh, sure. So when I lived in Alaska for a year, um, I was selling ice cream and frozen pizza and it was all frozen things. Okay. Um, we were distributing it all over Alaska and we so sold more ice cream per capita in Alaska than anywhere else in the U S you're kidding. So the coldest place in the U S sold more ice cream than anywhere else. We, we couldn't funny? keep it, keep the shelves filled. Uh, is that still true? Do you know? I don't know, but it okay. wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. I wonder if it's conceptually the same thing as like when you go to countries that are on the equator and everybody eats really hot food, like, like does the cold bring your body temperature down and then your little <laughs> internal heater kicks on? I don't or like, know. Oh, I don't, it's, crazy. You know, you're in cold and darkness. You might as well have that moment of enjoyment and who doesn't love ice cream. There you go. Yes. Okay. I love that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Are there any other women leaders or rising stars out there that you would like to elevate or just admire for the work that they're doing right now? You know, um, sure. You know, Sally Jewell. Yes. You, yes. Um, ex CEO of REI, former mm. secretary of the interior, I got to meet her a couple times earlier in my career and gosh, such a smart woman, mm -hmm. so friendly. And I read an article about her at one point and she was talking about how she divides her life into thirds. Okay. A third work, a third family and a third to philanthropy. Oh, and I thought, oh my gosh, there's a woman who, you know, is killing it in the boardroom. Yes and has found balance. And she said she kept those sacred. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was during, I read it during a time where I had two little girls and life was not in balance at all. And I just kept thinking, okay, if she can do it, I can yes. do it. Yes. Um, and so I've just watched her career forever and continue to be impressed yes. by what she does. Yeah. She's been, I've not seen her so uh, publicly in the last few years. I'm curious if you follow her, what she might be up to right now. I, I think she's at UW as oh, really, a, yeah. At, as a adjunct, um, helping out in one of their departments, mm -hmm. that so, would make which sense. I'm a Husky. So that's great too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Woof. Okay. Um, okay. Last question for you is what brands okay. or trends do you have your eye on and why? This plant-based trend is fascinating to me. Really? Um, mm -hmm. It's just thinking about, there's so many angles to it. You know, mm -hmm. there's the bioengineered meats, and then there's just the pure plant-based. There's things that, you know, um, are nuts that are inherently plant-based, but then are being reused into or used in different ways in new foods and mm -hmm. the dairy free and, you know, the whole dairy free thing is just exploding. And there's yes. those who are avoiding it for health, but there's others that just feel it's better for the environment. So mm -hmm. gosh, it, it kind of, it reminds me a little bit of organic when it really first yes. came into play, um, gluten free, there's the health element, but then there's also people enjoy how it tastes or so, um, it, it's going to be interesting. There's a lot of different terminology out there right now. There's a lot of different ways people are talking about it. So I think it will just continue to evolve and it wouldn't surprise me if it even went through another evolution of what we call yeah. that thing. Yeah. So I, I uh, am curious to it. I'm curious to see the con how consumers are responding to it. I really feel like almost anything can pre be produced now. Every once in a while, I'm still mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, that's kind of a cool <laughs> product. But really just watching consumers adapt and uh, see what sticks and what um, is just kind of a blip in time to me is quite curious. Yeah, I, yeah. I think a lot of it will stick. I think it probably is still going to evolve quite a bit more before it 
finishes, but yeah. Um, the things that people are creating now taste so great. And oh my goodness. So, yeah, um, I remember, I remember you probably remember this too. I remember buying organic cake mixes like in 2006 oh. <laughs> and seven and kind of going, yeah, I know it. I know it's better for me, but yeah, nope. <laughs> so food science has come a long way. Thank you. Food scientists. Yes, I to say that. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. Well, we have been talking with Erica Cottrell, Vice President of Marketing at Harbor Wholesale. Erica, if people want to learn about you more or maybe even Harbor Wholesale, where should they go? Uh, LinkedIn is a great place to find okay. us, um, myself and Harbor Wholesale and our brands are, are living out there on the internet. So you can find them on Instagram as well. Okay. And okay. I have to sneak this one in, which of the brands can you, or which of the products that, um, that you currently have, is there one that you have that is just like a secret favorite of yours? Oh my goodness. Do you have a one? Oh, they're going to kill me. Um, Probably the pizza. That's what I was doing. (laughs) And and our Via Vita pizza is really, really good. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to keep my eyeballs peeled for that then. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I am so happy to have spent um, this time learning a little bit more about you. And I look forward to seeing what you do next. And I want to thank our listeners Um, Thanks for your time today. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day and we'll catch you next time on The Gooder Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe and share with your network. Until next time, be well and do gooder. Gooder.